Hello, and welcome to the Nautical Institute's webinar on the subject of S-Mode. We are pleased to see that so many of you have registered and tuned in from all over the world, particularly given the time zones involved. Since the 1990s, Institute members have been worried about the diversity of onboard navigation systems and how, as mariners, they have to become familiar with so many different designs, often with only a short amount of time between joining a ship and that ship sailing. Back in those days, the complexity pertained to what we might today refer to as just a simple radar. However, today, decades later, the range of navigation systems and menus have expanded beyond imagination with radar, ECTUS, integrated navigation systems, and all the sensors and options they support. It is a requirement enshrined in the ISM code and the STCW that all mariners should be familiar with safety-related duties, and this absolutely includes navigation systems. In 2006, the IMO launched its e-navigation initiative to reduce onboard complexity and deliver usable systems to mariners. In 2008, the Nautical Institute proposed to the IMO a standard mode or S mode for navigation systems to bring standardization of key navigation functions across all manufacturers' equipment. At that time, it was envisioned that this standard mode or S mode could be activated at the push of a button. Ten years and a lot of discussion with key stakeholders later, the manufacturers have themselves proposed a greater application of standard features that would be always on for all systems uh, through their association CIRM. This seems to make sense, but we need to hear from as many mariners as possible to test this theory before it becomes official. This is your chance to shape your future. With me today at the Institute's London headquarters are Mr. Nick Lemon from AMSA, who serves as the chairman of the IMO Informal Correspondence Group on SMED, and Mr. Richard Doherty, the Deputy Secretary General and Chief Technical Officer of CRM, who will give you a presentation on the background to the CRM proposal for S mode. There will be a discussion session at the end of this webinar, so if you think of a question as we go along, then simply click the arrow in the top right of your screen to open the control panel and then type and submit your question. Following the discussion, Mr. Lemon will give you details of how you can learn more and more importantly, contribute your thoughts on this initiative before it becomes official. Gentlemen, welcome and over to you, Nick. Thanks, David, and hello, everybody. As David said, I work for the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, or AMSA. AMSA has been enthusiastic to see greater standardization of ships' electronic navigation systems and of ECTUS in particular. Through our port state control activities, we see a lot of evidence that suggests ships officers would be much better served if their navigation systems were more usable and if there were less differences between systems produced by different manufacturers. Hence AMSA has been a strong supporter of the need for S mode, which is now coming onto the agenda of the International Maritime Organization's Navigation, Communications and Search and Rescue Subcommittee. To prepare for this, Several interested organisations, including areas of academia and some IMO member countries, have formed an informal correspondence group, which AMSA has been coordinating. The aim of this informal group has been to prepare a first draft SMO guideline to submit to the IMO. In doing this, one of the biggest difficulties has been finding a way to make a guideline that addresses the needs of users for more standardization, but at the same time is acceptable and doable for the manufacturers. The draft S mode guideline we've collaboratively developed through this informal group is a compromise, but I think it ticks all the important boxes. It is pitched at a level that is suitable for IMO guidance. It should enable significant improvements in standardization and it has ownership and buy-in from manufacturers who will need to be proactive in using the guidance. 
Without this last ingredient, the guidance is highly likely to have been ineffective. I'm very pleased and grateful to be here today with David and Richard. We'll now hear from Richard who will explain the key sections of the guideline that the equipment manufacturers have contributed to this process. Over to you, Richard. Thanks, Nick, and thanks, David. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I am Richard Doherty, and I am Chief Technical Officer and Deputy Secretary General of CIRM, an international association of marine electronics companies. I am pleased to be here today to introduce CIRM's S-Mode proposal. Our proposal has been made available by the Nautical Institute, and some of you will have had a chance to take a look at it before joining this webinar. The proposal is based on a concept we refer to as always on standardization. And over the next 20 minutes or so, I will explain how we believe it will satisfy the user needs behind S-Mode in a more practical and flexible way than the original concept of S-Mode, which described a fully standardized and independent mode of operation. In terms of what I'll talk about today, I will begin with a brief introduction to CIRM and some consideration of the background to the CIRM proposal. I'll then provide an introduction to the proposal itself before looking more closely at the actual technical content. I will close my presentation with some thoughts on how CIRM would like to move forward with the proposal in terms of its evaluation and further development. I appreciate that some of those listening may not be familiar with CIRM, and so I'd like to give a quick introduction to the organization. The letters CIRM stand for Comité International Radio Maritime. We are a non-profit global association of marine electronics companies originally founded in Belgium in 1928. CIRM exists to promote the application of electronic technology to the safety of life and efficient conduct of vessels at sea. We strive to foster relations between all organizations concerned with electronic aids to marine navigation, communications and information systems. We are a non-governmental organization in consultative status to the IMO, the International Maritime Organization. And in that capacity, we participate in meetings of the IMO Maritime Safety Committee and several of its subcommittees. CIRM has approximately 110 member companies, including equipment manufacturers, system integrators, service providers, and companies providing equipment training to users. All of the major bridge system manufacturers are members of CIRM. Much of our work involves participation in regulatory meetings and the development of standards, including at organizations like IMO, ISO, IEC, and ITU. Finally, to give you a clearer picture of the sorts of companies that are members of CIRM, I will read out those companies that currently sit on our board of directors. Cobham Satcom, Danilek Marine, Faruno, Inmarsat, Kelvin Hughes, JRC, NCC Group, Aurelia, Radio Holland, Raytheon Anschutz, SIRM, SRH Marine Electronics, Transas, and CMAP. From the outset of this presentation, I want to make it clear that CIRM members fully accept the user needs behind S-Mode. We also accept that these user needs must be addressed by increasing the standardization of navigation, navigation equipment design in order to reduce the differences across systems produced by different manufacturers. However, whilst we understand where it came from, we see the original S-Mode concept of a fully standardized independent mode of operation as overly prescriptive, and we believe it would serve to constrain users and manufacturers. Instead, it is our view that the user needs can be met through a more practical approach that would reduce the differences between systems whilst retaining flexibility for the user and the producer, and that would make a separate standardized mode of operation unnecessary. Therefore, CIRM has been working within the informal correspondence group that is developing the S-Mode guidelines, in particular collaborating with the Nautical Institute to develop an alternative approach to S-Mode. 
Last year, the correspondence group invited CIRM to put our money where our mouth was by submitting a technical proposal on SMOOD for further consideration. Let's now look at the proposal itself. The CIRM proposal was drafted by our internal S-Mode working group with the input of bridge equipment manufacturers, service providers and companies providing training to users of bridge equipment. A number of physical meetings of the S-Mode working group were held over the last year from Singapore to London. The document we produced as a result of these efforts has now been submitted to the informal correspondence group and is proposed as the technical baseline of the S-Mode guidelines. The intention is that the proposal can now be evaluated by users and other stakeholders and further developed as required. This slide outlines the purpose of the CIRM proposal, which is exactly in accordance with the aims of the informal correspondence group developing the SMO guidelines. As it says here, the proposal provides requirements to reduce variation in navigation systems and equipment by increasing the standardization of system design, helping to provide users with timely access to essential information and functions that will support safe navigation. Furthermore, the proposal will contribute towards minimizing familiarization requirements for navigation equipment and systems, enabling users to locate and interpret information and react decisively. All of the work carried out by the CIRM SMO working group in the development of our proposal has been conducted under these terms of reference. Regarding the scope of the proposal, the technical content is contained in four separate appendices and I will shortly look at each appendix in more detail. The four appendices are complementary and each is an important part of the overall CIRM proposal. It is when the four appendices are implemented together that the full benefits of the CIRM proposal to standardization will be realized. Let us consider the scope of the CIRM proposal in further detail. The proposal is based on the concept of always on standardization, meaning that the standardization is always present on the user interface and it is not confined to a separate mode of operation. The proposal will significantly increase the standardization of user interface design, but by focusing on better standardization of key elements and permitting flexibility beyond those key elements, the proposal ensures that the varied and evolving needs of the user can continue to be met through innovation on the part of the system designer. It's the view of CIRM, along with a number of the user associations we work with, that this alternative approach to S-Mode which does not address the concept of a fully standardized mode of operation, better meets the needs of mariners, both now and into the future. I'll now look into the technical content of the CIRM proposal and take each of the four appendices in turn, beginning with Appendix 1. Appendix 1 is entitled Navigation-Related Terminology and Icons of Functions. It identifies a list of frequently used functions on navigation equipment and specifies the associated terminology, abbreviation and icons for inclusion on the equipment display. The list of functions has been compiled with reference to the equipment performance standards and the manufacturer's own experiences about which functions are most commonly used. The icons specified may execute a specific function and we refer to these icons as hotkeys. Other icons may provide access to a group of related functions, and we refer to these icons as shortcuts. Others still may indicate a status. Many of the functions included in the Appendix 1 list do not today have standardized icons and are handled differently across manufacturers. The next few slides will provide samples of Appendix 1's content to illustrate the concept. On this screen, a few hotkeys are shown. Hopefully, you will have already accessed the proposal and seen the full content of Appendix 1, which includes general functions and functions specific to individual equipment, including radar, ECTUS, and INS. 
You will notice that we have focused on the shape of the icon, but not on its color. This was a deliberate choice and reflects previous decisions by IMO not to specify standardized colors for navigation display symbology. I am happy to talk more about why we have not suggested standardized colors in our proposal after I conclude this presentation. It is also important to note that the CIRM proposal provides suggestions as to what we feel would be appropriate icons, terms, and abbreviations for the functions listed. Our members, of course, have plenty of experience when it comes to designing user interfaces, but we also anticipate that system users will have ideas about icon designs that are perhaps more suitable for the functions listed. Therefore, it is accepted and fully expected that users will disagree with CIRM suggestions and propose alternatives. That is all part of the future evaluation of CIRM's proposal. Here is another slide containing some of the hotkeys included in Appendix 1. On this next slide, you can see our proposed hotkeys for control of chart functionality. And this slide contains a sample of some of the shortcuts that are included in the CIRM proposal. And as I say, unlike hotkeys, which provide access to a function, shortcuts will link to a group of related functions. Let us now move on to Appendix 2 of the proposal. Appendix 2 is entitled Logical Grouping of Information, Essential Information Blocks. Its purpose is to define clusters of related navigational information that shall be grouped together on a navigational equipment display so that a user is able to quickly locate and react to essential information. Reflecting CIRM's interest to keep the S-Mode guidelines flexible, the proposal does not specify where the essential information blocks must be located on the screen. This is consistent with our ethos that increasing the standardization of the design of key elements of the user interface, for example, the icon shape, will make standardizing the actual location of that information less important. This slide presents sample content from Appendix 2. Again, the content is provided as CIRM's suggestion as to what information should be displayed together in a group. Again, we anticipate that Appendix 2 will generate a wide range of views when the proposal is evaluated. Moving on to Appendix 3. Appendix 3 is entitled List of Functions that Must Be Accessible by Single or Simple Operator Action. Both of these terms are already defi defined by IMO, as written here on the slide. Single operator action is defined as a procedure achieved by no more than one hard key or soft key action, excluding any necessary cursor movements or voice actuation using programmed codes. This effectively means the function should always be accessible from the user interface with one click. For example, an icon on the main menu bar that is never hidden. Simple operator action is defined as a procedure achieved by no more than two hard key or soft key actions, excluding any necessary cursor movements or voice actuation using program codes. For example, this could refer to an option that is available on the first level of a menu. The intention of Appendix 3 is to ensure that important functions are not difficult to locate in a system's menu structure. I appreciate that, if considered in isolation, Appendix 3 might not seem a significant development in terms of standardization, but when it is combined with the requirements introduced in the other appendices, it becomes an effective method to increasing system usability. On this slide, we can see some sample content from Appendix 3. Here you can see a number of functions listed and we have suggested that it is appropriate for some of these to be accessible via single operator action and some via simple operator action. 
This is again an area where during evaluation of the proposal it will be extremely useful to learn the preferences of the system users. Here is one further slide with some sample Appendix 3 content and I'll give you a couple of moments to glance through the list. Finally, we come to Appendix 4 of the CIRM proposal. Appendix 4 is entitled Standard and User Settings. These measures provide the user with a means to restore the equipment to a range of pre-configured settings. User settings allow the system user to, to store at least two configurations of settings for future recall. An example could be to store configurations for use during a particular navigational situation. Standard settings provide the ability for the user to return the equipment to a known state by applying a standard configuration. This would be particularly effective because the standard settings would be the same across manufacturers. On this slide, we can see some of the sample content of Appendix 4, specifically some of the standard settings suggested for ECTIS, which come from directly from the IMO performance standard on the INS, Integrated Navigation System. On this next slide, we can see some of the standard settings that we have suggested for radar, which again come from the INS performance standard. Well, that was a whirlwind tour of the CIRM proposal. As I say, it has been available online for some months now, and naturally it will remain available for those who would like to take a closer look at it. I'll now close my presentation with some very brief thoughts on how CIRM would like to move forward with the proposal. The informal correspondence group has conducted an initial review of the CIRM proposal and conditionally accepted it as the technical baseline of the guidelines on ESMO. However, the proposal will not be definitively accepted until users have had a chance to review and evaluate the four appendices and until user feedback has been used to further develop the proposal. At CIRM, we welcome such user testing and evaluation and we look forward to cooperating with members of the informal correspondence group and the Nautical Institute throughout the evaluation phase. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I will now hand over to Martin. Well, thank you, Richard, for a really interesting and thought-provoking presentation. Uh, we've now reached the discussion session. Uh, just a reminder that if you'd like to ask a question, then uh, click on the arrow in the top right of your screen to open the control panel, and then type your question in the box provided and hit send. So, I'm going to kick off uh, with this question. Um, what is the current state of progress and expected timeline for the acceptance of S-Mode? Thanks, Martin, and thanks for that question. Uh, expectation is that the IMO will take two years to consider this, uh, with it appearing on the agenda for the NCSR subcommittee uh, next year in February, and then also in early 2018. Uh, what is likely to happen then is that the IMO process will complete in 2019 and the SMO guideline should be published uh, later in 2019. Thank you, Nick. Um, another question here. Uh, what inputs do we have from sailing mariners on their opinion on the advantages, disadvantages and desired features of S mode? Uh, thank, thank you, Martin. Um, as, I, as I said earlier, we've been debating this for uh, 10 years now uh, with uh, as many mariners and trainers as possible. Uh, last June, we published a specific issue uh, of the Navigator magazine dedicated to S-Mode 
and requesting uh, people go to a survey to give us their key functions that need to be addressed by S mode and we had over a thousand uh, people do that so we are always looking for feedback um, the reason for holding this webinar is to reach out as wide as possible and we hope that you will all give us your thoughts afterwards uh, so that we can incorporate them before this becomes official at the IMO in 2019. Thank you, David. Um, another question here, why jump back to S mode and not to an individually personalized configuration setting? Thank you, Martin. Um, well, as you will hopefully have seen from my presentation, um, one of the um, <coughs> appendices that we are proposing includes what we're calling user settings, which is exactly aimed at that um, at being uh, allowing the user to set up a uh, predetermined set of configurations on equipment. So it, it is effectively personalized configuration settings that we're proposing as part of the SMO guideline. Thank you, Richard. Um, in practice, what is the difference between simple and single actions? Again, these are terms that have been um, defined by the IMO, and in practice, a simple operator action is one click of the trackball and one click of the mouse, and a simple operator action is two. So as I said during my presentation, the purpose of this is by assigning an access level of either single or simple operator action to specific functions, the intention is to ensure that those critical functions are not buried in menus and submenus. Thank you, Richard. Um, are all manufacturers involved, and why has this not been addressed much earlier? Uh, this could take quite a while to answer. <laughs> um, in terms of the CIRM membership, all manufacturers who are members of CIRM have been involved. And as we have a significant uh, proportion of navigation and communication equipment manufacturers as members, that, well, we can say that a significant number of these companies have been involved in the drafting of these guidelines. In terms of why has this, what was the second part, sorry, why has it not been addressed much earlier? Yeah. Um, I think in, this has been the only time we could really start to develop the S mode guidelines because it was dependent on getting the approval from IMO to begin the work and begin development of the output. However, increasing the usability of navigation equipment, I would say, from CIRM's point of view, has started to be addressed much earlier. And some of the recent um, additions of equipment standards, particularly the ECTIS equipment standard, the radar equipment standard, the general requirements on display of navigational information standard, these have been um, produced in, the recent, in recent years with better standardization in mind. And all of those um, equipment standards uh, contain measures to improve the usability of the equipment and to reduce uh, differences amongst manufacturers. Now, because those apply to new equipment, it will take a long time for those benefits to be realized and for the new equipment to penetrate the market. How will this guideline take possible differences into account for inner water transport? Right. Okay. Thank you, Martin. Um, the carriage uh, requirements for inland vessels uh, is uh, will will slightly differ uh, from uh, the Solus class, which is governed by the IMO. However, because they're often the same manufacturers that produce systems for inland uh, vessels as for uh, offshore vessels with the uh, Solus class, you will probably see a lot of the uh, features that are adopted in S mode being voluntarily adopted by those same manufacturers on um, units designed for inland uh, uh, vessels. What is the response of the flag states? Uh, 
it's a difficult question to answer actually. Um, Flag states obviously have interest to ensure that, that vessels registered uh, by them are safe and so uh, it's, I guess I'm making an assumption that there will be support for this um, and I say that's an assumption because we don't have major flag states involved in the informal correspondence group but I guess the real test to work out whether or not my assumption is sound will come early next year when when the uh, IMO first formally discusses this proposed SMAG guideline. I'll just uh, a little bit further to that. Um, the flag states that are represented at the IMO over the last 10 years have been very supportive of the concept of more standardization and have actually put it on the agenda, which is why we're here talking about it today. Thank you, Nick and David. Uh, why have colours not been used in the ESMO draft guidelines um, for icons and buttons? Thanks, Martin. I'll take that one. Um, we, when we were drafting the proposal, we made a deliberate and conscious decision not to specify standardised colours. And the reason we did that was because there is precedent in terms of IMO requirements on standardised symbology. If we look at some of the existing IMO requirements, particular circular 243 on presentation of navigation symbology. Originally, IMO um, transcribed those requirements from existing IHO requirements at the time, and the IHO requirements did specify standardized colors. However, when IMO drafted their circular and made it official, they decided not to include any standardized colors other than red, which is to be uh, reserved for the presentation of dangerous information. So it was a deliberate decision not to include standardized colors. If it is the feedback during evaluation that we need to consider standardized colors, well then that will be valid feedback. However, we should point out that IMO has considered this in depth and it was IMO that made the decision previously that colors should not be standardized. Uh, and the understanding that it is really the design of the shape of the icon that is the thing that must be standardized. Thank you, Richard. Um, has there been any simulated human interface testing with the manufacturers to see if the recommendations work in practice? Right. Uh, there has been limited uh, simulation testing uh, due to budgetary constraints. Um, the IMO itself does not have funds to, uh, to, to do that sort of simulator testing, so it's up to uh, individual organizations or flag states to do that. So there has been some done on, on a limited scale. We would love to do it on a much greater scale if funds were available. Uh, but I suppose that the manufacturers, the individual manufacturers, when they come up with their own designs, do do um, a, a fair amount of uh, testing. Is that correct, Richard? That is correct, yes, of course. Um, the major bridge equipment manufacturers have their own, I would say, fairly robust uh, human-centered design or user-centered design procedures in place. Of course, the purpose of S mode is to, it's, it's not to deny that that exists, but it's to reduce the variation in the, uh, the systems as presented to the, to the end user. So certainly it is the expectation that once this, this proposal is evaluated, um, the actual requirements that we're presenting in the in the proposal will be thoroughly tested by the experts. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, two questions. Is there a demo available, and do you expect that we will find a number of S modes, one for every manufacturer? Um, I will leave the demo question for now. Um, however, in terms of will we find a number of S modes, one for every manufacturer? Well, no. We don't believe we will. Uh, the reason for that is that the guidelines provide the, the requirements for S mode, and it is the intention that they're not partially implemented, but they are implemented in full. So therefore, because all manufacturers will be implementing the same set of requirements, it will not be possible to have uh, multiple versions of S mode in our understanding and in our intention. In terms of uh, testing or demos of the existing proposal, um, at, at the end of this uh, discussion, we will give you details of how you can go online 
uh, to do uh, to access demonstrations and also how to access other ways of testing whether it be through a, a company, an individual, or even a school. Uh, those proposals or suggestions will be made available following this webinar. Would the introduction of S-Mode remove the need for specific training? Uh, I'll take that one first, but I'm sure that uh, my colleagues would like to also answer that. Uh, simple answer is, um, the point of S-Mode is to reduce the familiarization burden. We understand today that there is a significant burden on users, particularly when it comes to ECTUS, um, to undergo familiarization and type-specific training in order to learn how to use their systems. Um, the, purpose, the underlying purpose of the S-Mode proposal is to significantly reduce that burden. At this stage, I'm not going to say it will completely remove the need for familiarization, which is, of course is, a, is an IMO requirement and will always be there. Um, and of course, there will always be a need for generic equipment training for, for the equipment involved. But certainly, the purpose is to reduce that burden. I'd like to take this opportunity just to clear up the, a, a, a common misconception about uh, type-specific training. The IMO uh, does not require type-specific training. Um, the IMO, and therefore the flag states that follow, require a generic understanding through training, and then through the ISM code, they require you to be familiar with safety tasks. Now that familiarization can take any form, and you have to demonstrate that you are familiar. How you gain that familiarization can be very wide and is up to the ship owner uh, to ensure that their seafarers are made familiar. With S mode, becoming familiar with future navigation systems should be much easier, but there will always be a need, as mandated by the ISM code, that all mariners demonstrate that they are familiar with these features. Are configuration settings for alarms included in S-Mode standardization? Um, currently, they are not. Currently, that is up to the user to configure. Regarding the ICON CRM uh, proposals, is, the, is there any usability test plan for them to find out, to find out users' opinions? As David mentioned just before, the, um, the idea is that at the end of this webinar we'll provide some details about how people can uh, log on to a website, either using a computer or their mobile device, and they'll be able to do some, some tests where they get, to, uh, they get shown these icons and so on and, and provide their uh, responses and inputs, and that information will be very uh, useful to help us uh, evaluate um, the proposed icons that have been put forward so far in, in Appendix 1. Thank you, Nick. Um, if S mode is introduced as a standard with the prominent manufacturers, how do we propose to include this as an international IMO requirement? Else is there not a danger that different manufacturers might have different S modes, confusing the mariner? Uh, I think as Nick explained earlier, the purpose and the intention of IMO is to produce the S-Mode uh, requirements as a guideline. And guidelines will never have the status as an IMO resolution or standard. However, it is the in terms of manufacturer acceptance, we would not have been so closely involved and we would not have spent so much time and effort in development of the S-Mode guidelines if it was not the intention of manufacturers to adopt the S-Mode guidelines. Now, also we should point out that one of the major benefits of the CIRM um, concept of S-Mode over the original concept of S-Mode is the CIRM proposal is, very, uh, is much more supportive of a quick uh, route to adoption. And let me explain what I mean by that. If IMO was to produce uh, S-Mode that defined a fully standard mode of operation accessible by button press, then that would only be present on new equipment because manufacturers would therefore have to undertake a lot of research and development and would have to uh, produce new systems. Now we know from experience 
Uh, new systems take a long time, perhaps up to a decade or more, to penetrate across the fleet because new equipment is only installed as replacement on existing ships or on new builds. Therefore, the benefits of that kind of S mode would take a long time to realize in practice. Now, on the other hand, with this flexible always on standardization approach that CIRM is proposing, it is very likely that existing systems will be able to be updated to at least partial compliance with the S mode guidelines through software updates. And that is one of the key um, benefits, we would say, of the CIRM conception of S mode. Richard, um, if, as Nick stated, these uh, uh, guidelines on S mode are adopted by the IMO in 2019, when do you think that mariners can start to see uh, the the um, uh, the impact of these on on their onboard systems? Uh, I'm going to be unpopular and not be able to give you a firm date um, because I just cannot speak uh, on the part of the manufacturers. However, what I can say is that as I've just alluded to. First of all, it will be likely that manufacturers will be able to update syst existing systems through software updates. Um, also, the fact that CIRM members have been so closely involved in development of the proposal suggests um, that they will be, they can, they will be well situated to be, let's say, early adopters of uh, the guidelines produced. Um, but I really can't commit to giving any dates as to when um, the manufacturers will have compliance systems. Well, thank you, everybody, for your questions. Uh, we hope that uh, this has been a, a useful, uh, useful opportunity for you. I'm just going to say a few, a few words to to just draw this to a close and uh, explain what the next steps are. And as we mentioned, uh, a couple of things about um, the, the further research and testing that will take place. So the next steps are that in uh, early next early next year in February, the Navigation, Communications and Search and Rescue uh, Subcommittee at the IMO will take a look at this first draft uh, guideline. And then this work will take place uh, in further improving the guideline over the course of the next year. And then in 2019, the IMO will get to see the finalised version and uh, decide on that. And hopefully it will be accepted. We have some researchers who uh, have been helping us along the way and they're going to be performing several studies but to do this we do need more user input and support from yourselves. In order to develop the standard terminologies and icons we need to test if these existing icons uh, are, are usable, whether they're understandable or whether in fact they need to be some modifications uh, made to them. To help do this, an online survey has been set up uh, by one of the research teams that have been helping us. They've taken great effort to make sure that the survey is short. It will take only five minutes to complete. Uh, you get shown several scenarios and you are asked to select an icon on the screen to perform a particular task. And whether or not it's the right icon is, the, is what the, what the um, survey will test. Uh, when information uh, is provided uh, later to you um, as, as a participant in this webinar, you will find in that information some details on how to access um, that survey. There will be a web link that you can use. I understand it's, user, it's also quite nicely set up and is able to be used on portable devices. Um, if you wish to get a copy of the guideline, um, again information will be provided on how to do that so, and also where you can provide uh, your inputs into the development of the guideline itself. The last three areas of the study are going to be a little bit more difficult to do. Um, the researchers will carry out these tasks and they will make information available to others who might want to join in and help them. So other research organisations, for example, could perform similar evaluations and tests. Again, information on where to uh, access those details will be provided when uh, information about this webinar is published. Thank you. The final uh, piece of information I should pass on is if you've registered for this webinar, uh, then you will receive a follow-up email which will contain those details. Uh, we urge you to pass the uh, details 
about the webinar for those who, who you think might be interested. Uh, they'll be able to then go to the Nautical Institute website and access the webinar and, and have the same experience that you've just had listening to the presentation from Richard and the discussion that we've had afterwards and there will be links to the uh, bits and pieces of further uh, work that will go on uh, including the, uh, the research activities and how to obtain a copy of the ESMO guideline and contribute to its further development over the course of the next year. Well, thank you, Nick. And uh, on, on behalf of the Nautical Institute, I'd like to thank you uh, both uh, for, for your time and efforts. Um, it will take us a few days before we can um, uh, produce anything further. So, we, as Nick said, anybody who's registered will get an email in a few days with more information on how to participate in these surveys. And hopefully, by the end of the week, we will have something on the Nautical Institute website. Uh, in the library section where you can access all this information and a recording of the webinar as well. So on behalf of the Nautical Institute, I would like to thank you all very much for tuning in and I hope you found it useful. Goodbye. <laughs>